First of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Alvin. I'm the PIC for this air workshop. Before I proceed to invite our speaker, I would like to tell you guys a little bit about our speaker's background and profile. Our speaker is Dr. Zafri Baharudin, which is a lecturer teaching robotics and AI in Uniten. He studied electrical electronics engineering also at Uniten, where he discovered robotics and founded the Mobile Robotics Club and the Center for Advanced Mechatronics and Robotics, which calls Camaro. He was graduated with his Master in Electrical Mechatronics Engineering at University Technology Malaysia in 2008. This was followed by his PhD studies in the field of Synthetic Aperture Radar at Chiba University in Japan. Now, he is leading the Camaro Research Group in Uniten, which focuses on mobile and inspection robots for electrical power infrastructure. He also serves as the Chief Research Officer of Exotic Sandrian Berhad to bring affordable intelligent vision automation system to small medium industries. Today, he will talk to you guys about artificial intelligence, AI, which is the in the future of robotics and machines that can ease our life. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Zafri Barudi to give his talk. Thanks, Alvin. Alvin, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah thanks, Alvin. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks also to uh, Evelyn and Ui for setting this up today. Um, uh, as Alvin has said, I was a Uniten graduate um, in 2003. So uh, this is just me giving back to Uniten. Also, I'm teacher, so <laughs> it's the same. Um, OK, I, I know. Um, we message that um, just to remind everyone. Uh, we message that we have to. If you have questions, you can write down your questions uh, in the chat, uh, as well as uh, if you have any. Because I really like interaction. Uh, otherwise, it's, I'm talking to my screen, which is uh, boring. Um, so I really don't mind uh, live questions. It makes things a bit more interesting. So uh, I just want to ask permission from we if that's. If there are questions, I don't mind uh, handling live questions. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm okay with it. Uh, but just maybe just have your hands up uh, if you don't know how to do that. So it's uh, at the top, there is an icon for you to, to, to give emojis. So put your hands up if you have a question and then uh, we will prompt me to, to then uh, cater to your questions. All right. Um, I'm here as uh, a as a representative of Camaro, right? So that's the Center for Advanced Mechatronics and Robotics. Uh, and we're, we're all fans of, well, we in Camaro are all fans of Transformers. And the first Transformers movie had a very pretty Camaro uh, in the form of Bumblebee. Uh, that's sort of why the name is Camaro. We made it work no matter what, lah, whatever it is. The, the words inside here, we, we struggle, whatever, lah, as long as we get the, the Camaro there. Um, what do we do? right? Um, in Camaro, we do things like robotics for uh, inspection. Um, this particular robot here, we uh, the name is Lisa, L-I-S-A. Um, we do inspection of uh, the word here is boiler. In TNB power stations, there are things called boilers, and we inspect inside the boilers um, because inside here is really hot. It's uh, hazardous for humans, so we just send Lisa to go inside. Um, we do things like uh, mobile robotics, uh, this is more of an uh, undergraduate and a master's level. So in uh, our undergraduate class, as well as uh, master's students, they get to uh, use uh, these mobile robots. This particular one is called the TurtleBot. Uh, we do um, other things with robotics, like uh, too many videos. Um, we build things like artificial muscles, uh, human computer interfaces. Uh, what is this? Side down. This is um, Uniten's very own humanoid bipedal robot. Bipedal means it's two legs. Um, yeah, so we do that as well. Um, we have here. Oh, so we have here. Um, this is the Now robot. Okay, so the Now robot is uh, made by Aldebaran Robotics. Uh, so we have one of these guys, uh, and we've performed experiments uh, with this little Now. Um, this is another mobile robot uh, where we perform something called uh, SLAM, which stands for, uh, it's a big word, simultaneous 
uh, localization and mapping. So this robot will at the same time, oh, will at the same time uh, perform localization. That means it knows where it is on the map uh, as well as create a map. Okay, so that's what it's doing at the same time. Uh, and then this last video down here is us doing things with uh, object recognition. So we can detect um, objects uh, that's come, that comes into the field of vision. This particular uh, model uh, application is for a, a vehicle. So to detect uh, vehicles on the road uh, and obstacles, other obstacles other than other vehicles. Um, and I got to work with um, Nano Malaysia uh, to come up with uh, the autonomous car. Uh, okay, so uh, sorry, what I'm doing is searching for a video, which I hope is correct. Hmm. Right, give me a second. I have way too many things open on my, on my, all right, okay. Yeah, two screens is really slowing down my computer. Anyway, um, um oh, doesn't say here, but uh, this is uh, Nano Malaysia's autonomous car, um, and I got to work on it um, on the vision AI side. So there's a camera on the top of the car. It's a prototype. So of course you wouldn't put a camera outside of the car. Um, but essentially we wanted to create as a proof of concept. There's, there's a camera at the top of the car. When there are objects in front of it, it will detect. If it's something dangerous, then it will instruct the car to stop. Uh, yeah, so we got to work on that, which is pretty cool. This is in Technology Park, uh, Malaysia, which is uh, a little bit after the Sungai Besitul. All right. Oh, okay. Well, wow, putting on a lot of videos really kills my. Let me try to reduce. Okay. Um. Next, uh, what we have here is a. Um. Uh, a clothes folding robot. Um. Uh. We have a, a robot with two arms over here. Um, you can see what it does on the video on the left, hopefully. Um, what we do is that um, the robot can recognize whether the, the piece of garment to be folded, is it a shirt, is it a, a towel, is it pants? We can know that because we that teach. Option. Yeah? I think I need one of the robots. <laughs> oh, you, <laughs> let me tell you the price of the robot, then maybe you'll reconsider. Um, <laughs> The uh, yeah, so we teach um, the robot uh, how to recognize uh, different garments uh, because we actually have many um, examples of those of pictures of those garments. Uh, if you, I don't have a piece of cloth here, but if you have a piece of um, cloth, a, 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 a garment in front of you, and you picked it up, and you had to look at it in a certain way, and then you figure out, oh, this is a towel or or a shirt. And it looks different every time depending on where, what part of the shirt you pick up from. Um, and so we had to create a, a way to uh, recognize the garment no matter which way we pick it up from. Uh, and that is done using a kind of AI. Okay. Uh, the robot's about, is it about the price of a cheap BMW? <laughs> so it's pretty expensive. Uh, some other work that we do in Camaro, this is this is actually um, in that river from the admin towards the COE food court. If you walk from the administration building to the COE food court, this is that river flowing down. Uh, and what we did is that we created um, a swimming dugong robot. <laughs> dugong, because dugong is sort of Malaysian. Um, this particular guy, uh, uh, this is us testing it here lah, with the fishes. You can see the little fish on here. Um, we, it got to swim at the National Science Center in KL. 
um, in the big aquarium there. If you've ever gone to the National Science uh, National Science Center in KL, as you walk in, there's a big uh, walk through aquarium, uh, and our robot, this guy, uh, got to swim inside there. Uh, it was a few years, few years back. Uh, oh, okay, there's some other videos off. Uh, yeah, I forgot the name. So the name of that robot is Tenang, Calm, Calmness and Peace. Uh, so this was us testing in an oh, aquarium, a smaller aquarium at the National uh, Science Center. Yeah, that's how it goes. Okay, um, and then some other experimental robotics on how to throw stuff. Um, that's also done with uh, a kind of AI to know where the target is and how how far to throw it. Uh, just so some examples of robotics in, uh, uh, sorry, AI in robotics. Uh, but I'll give a lot more examples uh, later on. Um, just some of our list of collaborators and friends uh, all over the world. Uh, I'll skip this. <laughs> we do quite a lot of work. All right, let's try to get into the, the topic for today, which is uh, deep learning. Oh man, I need to change it here as well. Deep learning for uh, vision applications. Um, so, uh, uh, we all have eyes, and we use the eyes to see uh, what's around us. And for humans, it's pretty natural for us to look at things, and we can recognize things. If we look at something, we know that oh, I'm looking at a cat, or I'm looking at a or a horse. We we, we learn over time uh, what objects are, what they look like, um, and so the more examples we see of them, the better our understanding of how they look like. Um, that's us as a human, but to make uh, a machine to understand the same way, it's a bit more challenging. Uh, and that's where our study is, to build artificial system, uh, systems that uh, can understand uh, visual data. Uh, so basically, you're taking your webcam, whatever I'm looking at over here, taking the um, data from this webcam, and then understanding what that webcam sees. Yeah, as an um, example, you can see um, anywhere that you find a camera, we can apply computer vision to that camera. And it's pretty, pretty much everywhere. You, you, have, uh, you have your phone. Your phone itself has at least two cameras, at least. Um, your computer that you're looking at now maybe also has a camera. If you go to a shopping mall, there are probably 10 cameras looking at you. A car, um, uh, even if it's not an autonomous car, might have at least one for the reverse sensor. Uh, if you have an auto autonomous car, you'll have many more cameras all around it. So computer vision can be applied to anywhere that you feel that a camera might be. Um, and so the learning part of a computer vision is that artificial system. We have to build an artificial system that can learn from the data. And, and we put here experience because the more data it, it sees, uh, or, or it has to learn from, the better it is at recognizing a particular uh, object. Um, and lately, there has been a jargon that's thrown around, and that jargon is called uh, deep learning. Okay, we, hear, we hear about AI, okay, AI in general, but then lately you hear the term deep learning. Oh, what is this now? Um, I'll show it a little bit, uh, hopefully, it's not too much. Um, it's to do with um, how many layers uh, of neurons we have. So our brain, um, uh, it says here it's loosely inspired by the brain because our brains learn because we have a lot of neurons connected to each other. And so the term deep learning is because we string up these neurons over a very long line. Uh, and that's why we call it deep learning. Um, it's just as a brief uh, explanation. Uh, okay, so the big area is called AI, artificial intelligence. There's a lot of things in it. Okay, so AI can be applied to computer vision, uh, as uh, as what I'm trying to explain today. Um, but there are other areas as well of uh, AI, which is called machine learning. Okay, so computer vision alone is also still a part of AI. Uh, and then there's a, an overlap in between. Uh, that would be uh, 
applying machine learning to computer vision. We have also deep learning, as I was explaining just now. So deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Don't worry about this subset or sets. I'm just trying to see where we are at. Okay, so my focus area is this area here, which is uh, where, where I take deep learning and apply deep learning methods to images. Uh, one image is just you know, uh, one image, but a video is actually a sequence of images. So computer vision will cover both a single image as well as video. Um, of course, AI can be applied to other things such as uh, language. So whenever you talk to um, Google, for example, I will not say the words because then all your phones will go boom. Uh, if, you, if you know what I mean, if we say, okay, you know that guy, um, or even Siri, for example, um, you are actually accessing a kind of AI uh, called natural language processing. So as you speak, the microphone will hear your sound waves and then try to convert those sound waves to become text. Uh, so we're doing something similar with computer vision is that we're looking at a, a picture and then we're saying, what's in this picture? Okay. Um, oh, sorry, that's what well, my example just now was for speech recognition. Uh, there's also the nat natural language processing there is to understand the actual meaning of the words. So if you have a sentence, uh, we want the computer to understand that sentence. Uh, robotics, because that's my background. Robotics is actually a, a bigger part is outside here, outside of AI, because there's mechanical, uh, elect electrical electronics. It's uh, out there somewhere else, outside of AI. So that's, the subset comes in there. So just to explain the whole area. Um, I'll go... I'll try to go quickly through this, uh, a brief history of uh, computer vision and deep learning. Um, so we're gonna go way back. Uh, in 1959, um, Hubel and Weasel uh, did an experiment with a, oops, sorry, with a cat. This poor little cat, what they did was, they uh, probed its uh, brain to measure its uh, to, to stimulate the, the vision of the cat and then, and then measure the brain activity of the cat. Uh, what they found was by showing specific shapes, um, it will give different kinds of responses. So as you can imagine, if, if any of you have cats, if you uh, show them uh, a string, they will suddenly feel very excited. If you show them... Um, uh, a picture of um, of a car. Maybe they won't be excited. You know, they was like, "What is this?" Um, and meaning to say that there are different responses to to different objects uh, that you show to the cat. What this has told the researchers is that different objects will give you different responses in your brain, in your natural. Well, in this case, it's a cat, but they inferred that knowledge to any other. Uh, visually based life forms, such as this. Okay, um, and that was 1959. In about uh, 1963, there there was uh, uh, Larry Roberts, um, which uh, did his uh, PhD work to study visually uh, to extract information from um, from images. Okay, let's say uh, the original picture is here. He's trying to extract out the, the, the edges. Okay, where are the corners, for example? Or where's the straight line? Um, which are called as features. Um, and this was um, Larry Roberts' um, uh, PhD study, uh, which he left behind. This was uh, he, he, just his PhD work. Uh, if you know this guy's name, uh, he went on to do something, uh, to create something called the internet. It's just a small thing. Uh, so something like computer vision that he did in his PhD here, it's a, it's a small thing compared to his actual con contribution, which is the internet. Um, moving on, um, in the 70s, oh, okay, never mind. In the 70s, um, they started to introduce 
uh, techniques to perform age detection. Uh, and then you could um, try to extract out a certain part of the image, uh, such as this ball, for example. You can detect the edges and you can find out where a ball is and you can extract the, that part of the uh, object from the bigger image. Uh, which tells you that you can do, uh, you can create a, a, a pipeline of processes and then each part of this process will do something specific. Uh, okay. Uh, then we moved on to a bit in the 70s. Um, there, were, there were a couple of studies that did, that did um, extraction of features of uh, the human skeletal structure. Um, so these are two separate studies. And, but what they both came up uh, as a conclusion uh, that they could, uh, they both had different approaches. Uh, one was to perform uh, something called generalized cylinders. And so uh, these, these, are, these two are examples of uh, points, data points that they extracted from an actual image of a person. Okay. Um, that was in the 70s. Uh, a more oops, sorry. A more recent piece of work. Sorry. All right. A more recent piece of work is this recognition via age detection. Um, if if you ever end up studying uh, image processing, you'll see uh, this uh, work quite a bit. It's called the Canny Age Detector. Uh, and it's a very uh, widely used age detector at that time. In the 80s, it was used quite a lot. Um, with the age detector, you can sort of discern uh, the shape of objects. Okay. Here we have, okay. So here we have uh, recognition via grouping, uh, for example, by color. Okay. So here we have an image of, um, uh, 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 an aerial view of um, umbrellas next to an ocean. You guys remember the ocean? We once could go to the ocean a long time ago. Um, uh, the one drawback that can be seen here is that uh, if we say that the blue color is the, uh, is the ocean, then these umbrellas would also be equated to be the ocean. Uh, and so there be you have to have some other rules there. So there's a lot of rules that have to come up when um, when you use uh, these methods. Uh, you have to say detect the blue color. Blue color is it ocean or is it umbrella? If the size is big, then you can say maybe it's the ocean. If the size is small, uh, then maybe it's an umbrella. Um, in the fruits case, for example, here's uh, a tomato. Tomato is a fruit, right? Okay, fruit or vegetable. Um, so it. If you're detecting uh, uh, a red color, maybe the uh, fruit is, uh, it can be detected. If it's green, then it's maybe not right yet. But when you see, we, if, when we try to differentiate the colors, you cannot tell that, you can see over here that, that they are fruits. But over here, the data is lost. Somehow it just blended in together. The system might think it's a leaf instead of a fruit. Um, yeah, but uh, you can put some rules in. Uh, some parts can be detected. Some information will be lost. Um, moving on to the 2000s, we have um, a, a method called uh, SIFT, which is a matching technique. So if you want to, if you're given a, an image and you're looking for a particular object, let's say the stop sign, you're looking for a stop sign. So inside your memory, you will already save, this is what a stop sign looks like. And then we, we apply this shift technique to look where inside this picture, where is, where is it most similar to this image on the left? Okay, so this technique can look for it and then we can say that uh, it's probably over here. Um, and so far in all these uh, techniques I'm showing, it's, uh, these are image uh, processing techniques. Okay. Uh, this is one of the lectures that we've had uh, in Unit 10. Um, but what I'm showing here is uh, face detection. Um, and so face detection, we all use it now whenever we take a photo of a person, there will be a, a bounding box on the face. 
because of course when you take a picture you want the camera to focus on the face um, and so this is among one of the first successful applications of um, vision machine learning uh, into cameras uh, if you bought oh, well maybe you didn't i bought cam digital cameras when it first came out um, didn't have this function but uh, slightly in in about the early 2000s uh, when you press the camera it will like lock on to somebody's face and then you can press the shutter uh, to take the picture uh, and that was enabled through work done by viola and jones in the early 2000s um, all right come 2007 there was a, uh, an, a, a challenge, a vision challenge made public uh, on the internet, which is called the Pascal Visual Challenge. So what it does is, um, in this challenge, they, they uh, opened up uh, a database and then they told every, uh, just opened up to the whole world to say, hey, perform uh, object recognition on this set of uh, images. So now we actually have one place where the entire um, community, uh, research community around the world can just focus on this one uh, data set to try and improve the accuracy of detecting objects inside the picture. Uh, and that sort of gave us uh, some focus and everyone kept on challenging each other to see who has the best um, uh, detector model. And so this graph over here shows that over time where when the Pascal challenge was introduced over time, the accuracy kept on increasing, which is natural when you have a focused um, study. Uh, next is after the Pascal challenge, uh, because the, the accuracy, uh, people were getting really good accuracies already, uh, there was a bigger challenge, okay, which is called the ImageNet um, challenge, which consists of a much larger um, data set of pictures. It has like 1.4 million images. You can go there actually now, if you Google up ImageNet, you can find the data set still available now. Um, and instead of just detecting a small number of classes, um, it has 1,000 classes. Uh, let me explain a little bit what a class is. Um, so let's say I have here a, a phone, and a, a mug, okay? So if I teach a system to detect only these two objects, a phone and a mug, so these, these are two classes. One class is a phone, another class is a mug. So in the image net challenge, there are 1,000 different classes. That means 1,000 different objects. There can be a, a horse, there can be a house, there can be cars, there are boats, there are aeroplanes, there's a thousand different objects. So the challenge has become much more complex. Um, which then, okay, which then um, I'm showing in this slide, um, it, it's a bigger challenge, of course, for the researchers. But um, just as we saw in the Pascal challenge, um, the accuracy kept on improving. Okay, so uh, this graph here is not accuracy, it's actually the error rate. Okay, Zoom in. Hmm. okay. so it says here error rate. Uh, that means how uh, error rate means how 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 wrong are you? <laughs> okay, um, the error means is how wrong are you? So a, a smaller number means you are less wrong, more correct. Um, and then there's a line over here in red color is the human error rate. So let's say if we give a human to look at this image net data set and we tell them to uh, classify the images that, that, that the person sees, a human will get it right, uh, will get it wrong 5% of the time. Okay, so that's what we mean by error rate. When image net was introduced in 2010, the error rate of the developed systems was about uh, 28%. But as we go on, the research, uh, of course, the trajectory will improve over time. Over time. Uh, somewhere around 2012, uh, AI was introduced. Oh, sorry, not AI, deep learning specifically, the deep learning techniques. Uh, and we see a very big jump in improvement 
uh, of the error rate. And then, that means the system got fast, uh, got, got smarter really, really fast. Um, and as we go on, somewhere at 2015, we cross an important threshold. What is that? We cross the point where the, an artificial system is better at classifying the objects, better than a human. So this was a point when, when a lot of people got concerned, like, huh, we actually built a machine that's smarter than a human. That's what it seems like, right? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, and so what happened exactly at, at this 2012 point here? Uh, something called um, a deep learning network, which is called LXNet, was introduced in 2012. Okay, and that's what it looks like. That literally, that's well, that's what we draw it to look like, um, and we call it a deep uh, network because it has many, many layers. Uh, and in fact, each one of these layers, you can see the number over there. It has 128 layers inside here. It has 192 layers inside here. Um, so that relatively is quite deep um, in terms of uh, you know layers. Uh, you don't need to go so, so serious uh, on that, uh, but uh, hopefully I can, uh, I get to show you uh, why we call it a deep network. All right, um, so now let's turn back the clock. Okay, we somehow got here already, so I'm going to turn back the clock because uh, what we've gone through over here was the image processing uh, approach to, to recognizing objects in images. So we're going to turn back the clock and see what was the AI approach. Um, so somewhere along, uh, back in 1958, uh, along the time of the CAT experiment, um, there was introduced something called the perceptron. Oh, what a big word. <laughs> the perceptron is actually a, a machine. It's this physical machine over here. Um, and then inside this machine is actually a, a bunch of uh, resistors. Uh, if you went to, uh, if you took science in high school, uh, you have those potentiometers. So uh, a potentiometer, you can sort of change the value, right, from zero to how many, 100 ohm or 10,000 10, ohms. Um, and inside here are a, a lot of those potentiometers. Okay, we can short form as spots. Okay, there's a lot of potentiometers inside here. Uh, what, what are they for? They are sort of like, tuning pins for the values of neurons inside your brain. And so when we tune these potentiometers, inside uh, and the input, you can give it a picture, for example, and then at the output, it will tell you what it is. Uh, and in the case of uh, this experiment, I do believe they were just, uh, they were just trying to make out numbers. Mm. Numbers. Okay, like one, two, three, four, five, just like that. So you input a picture of a number and then the output, it will tell you what number it is. Sounds simple, right? Um, but it was done manually. It's like a, it was a literal physical machine uh, and they call it the perceptron. So the tron there, if you, uh, if you look at the old machines, there's a lot of trons in, in a lot of their, their machines. Um, so if we go on throughout time. Um, there was a, a study by Minsky and Peppert uh, in 1969, which they wrote down, uh, they wrote a book um, about the perceptrons. Uh, but what they, uh, it, it wrote a lot of good things inside the book. Um, but one thing that they highlighted about the perceptrons that it couldn't learn something called the uh, XOR function. So and, um, just to, just, Sorry, I will dive, dive a little bit to this XOR. So an XOR function is when you have, uh, okay, so you have two inputs, uh, uh, two values, X and Y. Uh, if the two values are uh, exclusively uh, different, uh, no, yeah, are, are different, uh, if the two, two values are different, then we will give it a value of one. So if you look at these two values, X and Y, Zero and one, they are different values. So we give it a, uh, the output is one. One and zero, uh, they are both different values, and then it's a one. 
if it's one and one, okay, that means the values is the same. One is equal to one. So it's not different. So we'll give it a zero. So an XOR function will give an output of one if the inputs are different. If the input is the same, we'll give it a zero. Basically, that's what it is. Um, but what, what Minsky and Pepper showed was that this is a relatively simple uh, logic, um, but the, the so-called perceptron, which is supposed to be mimicking the human mind, uh, cannot, uh, cannot learn this function. Uh, and the, the issue uh, is with the fact that um, the perceptron is a, is a linear classifier. So let, let me write that down. It's a linear classifier. Uh, and you know the term linear. A linear means it's a straight line. All right. So if I want to try and draw a straight line, I cannot separate uh, zeros and ones together. So like if I draw a line this way, I somehow have one and zero on both sides. I cannot draw a line to somehow separate or, or to group um, zeros together and ones together. Uh, I can do like that, but that's, that's not a linear line. Uh, I can sort of do it like this maybe, okay? but that's not a linear line, um, nor, nor is it like that. Okay, I cannot draw a straight line to separate them. Um, and so the, the newspapers got, once upon a time there were newspapers, the newspapers got onto this and reported on it. And so people thought, was like, ah, uh, AI is no good. Lah. Artificial intelligence is not smart. So for a long time, after this study, people uh, didn't look at AI. They thought it was not good enough. So there was a big gap between 1970s, a whole like 10 years, people didn't really pay attention to AI. Uh, coming into the 1980s, um, uh, Fukushima decided to still proceed on with uh, their own work on AI, uh, which led to this sort of uh, structure where you have uh, layers connected together, uh, layers of what actually. So inside here are layers of um, let's just call them values. Lah. Just a bunch of values inside there. Okay? Uh, just a bunch of numbers inside here. Uh, but they're grouped together uh, in layers. Okay? Um, which, if you recall, this looks a lot like the AlexNet um, that we saw in 2012. Uh, so this was the beginning of it. Okay? Um, Okay, they say there's something, uh, a method called Brett propagation. I'll not go into this because uh, it's a bit too technical, but it's an important method nonetheless. Ah, okay. In 1998, where there was a um, uh, Sean LeCun, um, uh, an AI engineer, came up with um, an, an AI network which he called Le. You just slap your name uh, with the net at the back, uh, and then you you it will become a, an AI network. Uh, I haven't come up with Zafri net yet, but if you guys want to come up with something, just slap your a net at the back, yeah, and then uh, you have your own uh, AI network. Um, so what does the net network do? It it takes um, an an image with uh, which is a very small size. Uh, this thirty two by thirty two here means it's a uh, 32 pixels by 32 pixels. You know your cameras, when you take a picture with your camera, that's like 2,000 by 3,000 pixels or something like that. It's very high resolution. Um, but what the work by Sean LeCun uh, showed is that with a very low resolution, just 32 pixels uh, width and height, he fed it through his own custom network here uh, of, again, a bunch of numbers. Uh, pass it through his network, and then at the output, it will it will guess num uh, um, okay, let's just say digits lah, uh, zero until nine. This is obviously an A, which is not a digit. So let's say <laughs> let's say it's the number nine, for example. Okay, so it will guess uh, input as a number nine, and then it go the the values of this uh, image is passed through this network. Okay, by some sort of uh, calculation magic. And then at the output, it will guess like, I think this is a nine. Okay. Um, so what 
uh, was done with this Lenet network is that they applied it into uh, to process handwritten checks. Um, okay, I guess we I need to explain what a check is, right? Um, a long time ago, when people wanted to give other people uh, money, but not in the form of physical cash, we could sign checks. Um, but when we sign those checks, we actually have to write down the numbers of the account number, who is the recipient, how much is the amount of uh, money to be transferred, and that's all handwritten. Um, in the banking industry uh, at that time, there will be a lot of handwritten checks, which would take a lot of people and thus a lot of money to uh, go through all of these uh, handwritten checks. So they applied this Lenet into uh, an electronic device developed by NEC, uh, which is an electronic company. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Uh, and to automatically read the handwritten checks. Okay. Um, yeah, so that was a major contribution. Uh, yet another example of how uh, an AI is implemented in real life. Um, and then we've uh, gone on, let's move on the time scale. Uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the year 2000s, uh, people started to uh, pick up uh, work from, uh, that was developed by uh, Chan Le Kun. Uh, and a lot of work was done to uh, improve on that over the years. And, and that's the introduction of deep learning because they kept on combining these networks uh, and stringing them up to, to, to become much larger networks. Um, I'll skip this. Uh, and then we reach the 2012, um, where just now we introduced the LXNet. Okay, so these are some examples of how uh, an, an image classification task is performed um, by an AI. So you give it an image, and then there will be scores to say what, what is what is it that the system sees inside this image? Okay, so see some examples over here. Okay. Um, I think, okay. Um, I need to break apart this word a little bit. Uh, Convnet means convolutional network. Um, you don't need to worry about what it is. It's just that the word comes up quite a lot. Um, and then um, you'll see also the term convolutional, convolutional neural network. Um, so you'll just see it a lot. Um, it's basically um, a mathematical equation uh, that we apply to perform the calculation inside uh, the AI. Um, I, I don't want to go into the math of that, so I'll just leave it at that, just to let you at least know what the, does the conv here, part here mean. It's convolutional. Um, okay, maybe I'll just explain a little bit. Con convolution is basically the similarity between two pieces of data. So that's what it is. What is the convolution between object A and object B? What you get is the similarity value. Um, yeah, and so um, here I would like to highlight what are the applications of uh, deep networks. So we have here image classification. So given a picture, you, we want a classification of what is it that it sees. I'm showing a mug and then the, the AI should say that looks like a mug. Okay. Um, object. Detection, so just to compare different different things, okay. Object, this now sorry, recognition, right? No, classification. Okay, so classification is this is a mug, and then you say, Oh yeah, that's a mug. But object detection is that's a mug, and the mug is located over here, which is why inside this image you can see uh, we there are these bounding boxes. It says that this is a horse, okay, but it also says where is the location of the horse. So if this is a bus, where is the bus? If this is the person, where is the person inside that picture? So the word here is object detection. So two things already, uh, classification 
and detection. Different, right? Uh, another thing over here is segmentation. So to segment is like, if you see a mark, okay, the mark is over here, all right. Now, where is the outline of the shape of the mark? Okay, that is called segmentation. Okay, so three words. Uh, classification, detection, and segmentation. AI can be applied to all of these uh, examples. Okay, uh, this is just showing that you can apply to video streams. I'll skip this because I've already been chatting for like one hour, uh, too, too long. Uh. I want to get into the examples. Um, things like post recognition. This one, I think I'll try to... Can I do it now? Let me try. Uh, okay. Uh, I think I want to try and go through uh, some of the live uh, examples now. Okay, so if you want to do your own uh, uh, classification model, uh, uh, an easy website to, to go to is this Teachable Machine. So you just Google Teachable Machine, you'll end up at this page. Um, it's, a, it's a Google site. Okay. Uh, let's just go to getting started. Okay, uh, there are three different projects here for image, audio, and post. Uh, I'll give quick examples for uh, a couple of them. So let's say an image, right? Uh, wow, this is new. Oh, we can do for microcontrols already. This is great. Sorry, it's new for me. Uh, let's go with a standard image. All right, so what are we going to do here? Um, sorry, I'm going to turn off my camera for a minute because I'm going to use my camera. But you will still be able to see... Uh, my screen, hopefully. Okay, let's get some objects. All right, so let's say we want to train um, an AI to learn some objects. I'll turn on my webcam over here. All right, so that's me again. Uh, let's say I want it to learn my remote control. Okay, so let me rec... Hmm. Did it save my settings from last time? Uh, okay, so, sorry, I used it previously, so it saved a bit of my settings. So let's say I want to, I want it to detect um, this this remote. So I'll full record. So I'll just move it around a little bit. Okay, so I've taken some sample images of this remote control. So it should have recognized it. So I give it a name, remote control. That's one object. So let's uh, have another object. Let's say, um, let's do me. So this is a, a Zafri. Um, and then I'll press hold to record. Okay, and that's me. I'll just move around the screen a little bit. Okay. Um, and yeah, so here is a data uh, that we're going to use to train. So I'll press the button train model over here. And it's performing the training inside the browser. Um, I'm a little concerned that my, my computer is going to die on me. So let's hope it's OK. Yeah, it doesn't take too long. OK. And then on the right-hand side here, we're going to test it out. So see, down here is the output. It already detects this, this picture here is a Zafri. So let me bring this guy over here. Oh, it's a remote control. Oh, this is a Zafri, so already it works, okay? Um, we can expand on this a little bit by saying that, let's say you want to create like uh, a detector to detect whether you're wearing a face mask or not. Okay, so let's uh, turn this off for a second. Um, so this is Zafri, uh, no mask. Let's add another one, Zafri, uh, with mask. Turn on the webcam. Okay, let's put on my mask. Okay, record. Yeah, let's see some images. Mm, a bit more. Okay. Uh, and do the same thing. Let's press train. Okay. Uh, 
so far, do you see me using any coding, any programming? No, right? And like, I didn't use any programming at all. Um, all right, so that's a Zafri without a mask. This is Zafri with a mask. Hey, so it works. You want control? Yeah. How about both together? Ah, oh, it's confused. Okay, sometimes it's this, sometimes it, oh, it depends which one is in front. So you can see over here, if I show a mug, ha, huh, we it cannot recognize the mug because we didn't teach it. Sorry, I don't know if you guys can hear me. It cannot recognize any object that we didn't teach it. Okay, so this is something very important to realize. An AI is only as smart as whatever you teach it. So if you teach it an object, it will learn that object. If you didn't teach it, it will, you, it will never know. Okay? Um, yeah, so if I show a phone, it thinks it's a remote control because it looks most similar to a remote. But you can see the remote has a high confidence, 100%. This one, the confidence is eh, meh, somewhere in the middle, okay? No questions at all. Huh? Okay. Uh, all right. So this is the teachable machine. And you can try this out yourself. Uh, straight away, you can apply. Um, sorry. You can apply. Uh, you can create uh, an AI model. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, once you have trained it, what you can also do is that you can export the model. Okay, you can export the model to a browser, that means you, you can create your own web application, uh, like a website, to perform the same detections. Um, you can export to other computers. So you can have a, a separate computer, you plug a camera into it, and then put this code in to detect the same thing that you're detecting over here. Um, you can export it. TensorFlow Lite here means it's you are exporting to um, smartphones. So if you want to export this model that learns how to detect a Zafri, you can export it uh, via this button here to your handphones. Um, and as we saw just now, which I it was new for me, um, it could you can also embed into microcontrollers. This is great, man. That means if you have like Arduinos and such, you can you can even uh, export for it to run on microcontrollers this is great. Um, okay. Uh, next, you can do things uh, with audio as well. I'm going to try to pause. Um, yeah, let's try. Will it access my webcam? Maybe not. Okay, here we go. All right. So with the um, the. The, the third option I chose now, it's called the pose net because you can see it's detecting sort of like my skeletal structure as an example. Okay. Um, you can do things like, uh, it's similar to just now, you can train a class to say like, um, I don't know, something like right hand. So like I'm carrying my right hand, so take some Example pictures over here, like that, right hand, right hand, right hand. Um, and then, then maybe over here I can do left hand. Turn on the webcam, record some examples of the left hand. Yeah, and do the same thing, train the model. You can see how quick it is. Um, again, uh, all right, so maybe some, some things that you might need to be aware of is things like, uh, um, Okay, so I'm not carrying any hand at all, but it thinks I'm moving my right hand. So I need to put another class to say like, um, both hands down or something like that. So otherwise, right hand, left hand, is it that? Okay. Um, it, it, the way that we have it now, it makes it look so easy uh, to implement, but something like this, maybe like five years ago, is so difficult to achieve. Um, and, and well, and you have it now uh, very easily. Uh, same thing, you can export these models um, to use them on any of the devices I talked about just now. All right, so I'll close this. Um, let's go back to my deck. Um, so just, that's a, that was an example much closer to home. You can try it out yourself after this. Um, there's uh, other implementations 
such as um, there's a there's a challenge to detect whales from satellite images. There there are challenges to detect uh, galaxies or uh, like like this one here is to detect uh, cancer cells um, from uh, medical images. Um, here's an interesting uh, application. It's to caption an image. Okay, so like over here is uh, it's like showing there's a picture. So this this text down here is actually a text then that has been generated by an AI. Okay, so um, give it a picture and then it says a man in a base in a baseball uniform throwing a ball. But you know, I mean. This is not exactly right because we know that in this post, he's probably catching the ball rather than throwing. Uh, this picture on the right, a woman is holding a cat in her hand. Hmm? Yeah, that looks like a cat on her hand. <laughs> um, so, uh, the, the, again, AI is, can only be uh, as smart as whatever it has been trained on. And um, if, it ha if it has not seen pictures like exactly like this before, it will not be able to describe it properly. Uh, but it's pretty interesting to see what it says. Um, this one here is a, a style transfer. So there's, there's a website, deepart.io. You can try it out yourself. Uh, these are ones that I tried on the website. Um, I can mix styles and then at the output, you get you know an, an artwork based on a particular style. Um, I like this one because this is, uh, if you know LUT, that's a LUT cartoon. And I took the Mona Lisa added the two together and then the output, it looks like that. So it's like somebody, like if uh, LUT drew Mona Lisa. I thought this was interesting because uh, LUT actually drew the Mona Lisa. So I think that's pretty close <laughs> that, that uh, an AI could guess based on just one photo, uh, the art style of an artist. Uh, you can try that out yourself. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I think I need to, uh, sorry. Wait a second, I will skip this part here. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to just show more examples now because uh, I think I've gone through the bulk of the, the knowledge already. Okay. Um, right. So if you want to uh, try it out yourself, you can try going to any, well, CNTK is not that famous anymore, but um, the free ones would be Mm, TensorFlow. Why is PyTorch not here? Okay, so there's something else called PyTorch. Let me write that down. Uh, PyTorch. PyTorch is by Facebook. Uh, TensorFlow is by Google. Um, and there's another one. There's a new one by Google called Jax. This just came out uh, recently. Okay, uh, you may have heard something called um, YOLO, which some of you might say you only live once, but in, in the AI world, YOLO means you only look once. Um, and that was developed by um, a researcher who publishes on a place called Darknet. Um, and it's also freely available. Uh, of course, some of the other big companies, you have MATLAB, uh, Intel makes their OpenVINO. Uh, you can try them out. Our initial focus has been um, just another example of uh, AI being applied to drones. Uh, if any of you fly drones, uh, you probably notice some drones have this feature to follow a person. And so when, as the drone is uh, flying, you can ask it to, uh, to track a car or track a person who's running in all these graphics. Sorry, a person riding a bike. Uh, so the computer will track the person and then uh, while well, it's doing several things, it's avoiding objects uh, or obstacles as it's flying around. But it's also tracking the person 
to ensure that the, the distance between the person and the drone is of a particular set distance. Okay, so that's one application. Um, these are more robot applications, which I think we've seen enough. Um, all right, so this is an interesting one uh, by Open, uh, uh, a research institute called OpenAI. Um, and so what, what uh, this is an actual robot hand, okay? Uh, and what it's doing over here is there's a camera looking at the, uh, the arm and saying that make the cube um, face this orientation. Okay? And so the target of the arm is to just move around the cube to reach this, uh, to, to make it match, to look like this. So it has to, A has to be at top, N has to be at the left, O has to be on the right. Okay, then it's correct. Um, so this, as you can imagine, I mean, if you try to do it with your own hand, that's already very difficult. Um, but how do you teach a machine to do it? The machine would have to learn from quite a lot of examples. Uh, and so what they have done over here is that um, they, had, they, they simulated the hand to move the cube it simulated, that means it's not real. There's only one real hand here. But what they did was they, okay, so this is the simulation. They simulated uh, the hand moving um, in, in, in many other computers first. Uh, and then combine the knowledge uh, of all these different computers into one. So that one, uh, that all the knowledge is inside one computer. Uh, I would equate this to, if you watch Naruto, Naruto could do the Kagebushi no Jitsu and he split himself up to learn the Rasengan. If you watch that episode. Eh, obscure? If you watched it, maybe you know. So Naruto split up, all his different shadow clones learned the, Naruto, the, the Rasengan technique. And then when the clone disappeared, all the knowledge went into the original uh, Naruto. It's similar to this. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you got that. Never mind. Um, all right. So, okay, um, I'm trying to skip a lot of slides because I think I'm talking for too long already. Um, I probably want to show, okay, this would be my last piece of knowledge to, to tell you, which is the types of machine learning. Uh, and there are three types, okay. supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement. So three types of machine learning. Um, and, and deep learning can be embedded inside all of these uh, three types. Okay, let's take a look first at supervised learning. Uh, supervised learning, if you imagine uh, a, a parent and a child, um, it's sort of like uh, you're, if you imagine you are the parent and you're teaching a child what is an apple and what is an orange. And so you would show the child, this is an apple, this is an apple, this is an apple, and this is an orange, this is an orange. And the more that you teach, uh, the more that you show examples, um, the better the child will be at remembering uh, what is it that you taught it, uh, the child. Okay? Um, and so that's basically what supervised learning is. Uh, we have a, a, a data set of uh, information that has been categorized. So in this case, a bunch of photos of cats and dogs. And we already know which photo is of a cat and which photo is of a dog. Um, we pass all these photos into, let's call it the network, okay, um, for training. And then at the output, we'll find out if we give it a new picture, okay, and then it passes through the same network. Okay, so the network over here, once it has been trained, we uh, feed it with a new picture. And then at the output, it would guess whether it's a cat or a dog. So based on the number, it thinks, hmm, 95%, I think it's a, it's a cat. Okay, so this is supervised learning. You, you must have a data set that already is classified into the categories that you want your system to learn. Um, some examples of what we have. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, destroyed your ears there. Oops. Um, 
an example of where we applied this technique is in a um, car, car part manufacturing plant. So this is a, a manufacturing plant in uh, Denai Alam. Uh, so when we went there, we saw that people were inspecting the parts coming out of the stamping facility manually. So these two gentlemen over here will receive uh, products and they will inspect the products manually. Yeah, that's the CEO of the company. And so that these two are his staff inspecting the products for quality control um, and also to count the number of uh, stocks. Uh, what we did over here was we created a, 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 an AI uh, system to differentiate between the different uh, types of car components. These are, these are car components for a uh, Produa MyV. Uh, the, the internal parts. Okay. Um, and so we can show that we can recognize the different types of parts. Okay, let's move on. We can also detect the shapes on the parts because sometimes the stamping machine misses a hole, for example, and then we can detect uh, if any of them are missed. We can also detect uh, damage such as cracks. Okay, so when we show over here, we can detect there's a crack or things like uh, scratches. Okay, so these are damages that when the company sends over to Produa, Produa will not want any uh, of their products to be damaged. So the quality control will happen at the factory before it is sent out to uh, the main Produa plant. Okay, uh, this is what we did. Uh, this was an FYP project. Um, one of my students did it uh, in 2019. Um, this is another example of um, uh, Personal protection, protective equipment (PPE). Um, a similar example just now when we did the face mask, whether you're wearing a face mask or not wearing a face mask. So similar, similar here for construction sites uh, or a factory floor, um, people must wear the personal protective equipment. Uh, and so we created a system to to uh, detect all that. Okay, so that's. Uh, supervised learning. You must have the data set first. We teach a system to learn from the data set and then it can infer. So all the examples so far that I've showed you are all supervised, including the one from the teachable machine just now. Um, next, the second one is unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning, um, I can equate it to if I give you uh, a whole basket of fruits, and this, all these fruits come from, um, from Africa. So you've never seen these fruits before, but I really don't know uh, what fruits are in Africa, but you've never seen them before. There's a, there's an, um, a blue colored fruit, and then there's a purple colored fruit. Well, you've never seen these fruits before. What are they? You have no idea. Um, and so unsupervised learning is you trying to group together uh, these strange fruits that you've never seen before. So you take the blue ones, you group them all together. You take the yellow fruits, you group them all together. Um, and so, but you don't know what they are. You're just grouping all the similarly colored fruits together. Um, and that is unsupervised learning because nobody is telling you how to group it uh, or what it is. You're just uh, grouping them together just based on similarity. Uh, and that's unsupervised. Okay, so different, right, from... Uh, supervised, supervised, you already know what they are. Unsupervised, you don't know. You're just grouping them together. And then uh, from uh, outside of the group, mm -hmm. sometimes you will have objects that are not similar at all. And we call them, we call these uh, objects anomalies. Which could be something like in quality control. Uh, you know products of good quality are grouped together. And then sometimes when you detect something that is outside of the uh, any of these normal groups, it could be a product that is damaged. Okay, and then you take it out, you take it out of the batch. Um, yeah, so I think I compared that quite well already between supervised and unsupervised uh, learning. Um, the last type of learning is called reinforcement learning. So this is very interesting. Um, uh, an example here is uh, an AI that's learning how to play uh, a game, for example. Uh, so the, uh, this is uh, an example given by Google's uh, DeepMind. Um, 
it's uh, the the system okay which is uh, the agent over here um in the beginning it doesn't know how to play the game um so in the first 10 minutes it's just trying to learn uh, you will see the movement at at the bottom if you know this game you know the objective is to score as well to to remove as many bricks as possible and your only input movement is this uh, bar at the bottom okay um so in the beginning you can see that it was sort of moving randomly but after 120 minutes of playing it's it's kind of like an expert already because it's it's moving really fast it knows um how to uh, shoot exactly at um the bricks now the uh, that's cool and all but what happens when you keep on training the system okay after 240 minutes of training the system starts to learn tricks and if you've played this game before you also know that trick which is you dig on one side so that the ball can enter the top and then it will much more quickly get the scores so the the point to take away from this is um uh, a reinforcement learning approach you can find what you can get a system to learn tricks around your set of rules um okay so what they have um uh, okay, the example was from deepmind uh, open ai again uh Uh, apply the same dear fellow scholars this is 2 minutes right so uh apply the same reinforcement learning method uh to a game of dota um if you play dota before you know the it, it's it's a very complicated game because you have several teams human teams uh to fight each other the situation in a map changes all the time uh, uh and then um Uh, there's a strategy in, because you're fighting with teams of players so you have strategies between your team members and then you're fighting uh the strategy of the other team um so what has happened over here is that they pitted uh, an ai uh, uh an ai system against um another team a, a team of human players so what they have done with the ai uh team uh, the ai system is that they have overtrained it so just like before in the game in the atari game simple atari game um what has happened is the ai learn a uh, a tactic a strategy that the humans have never seen before um and that once people saw this strategy being implemented by the ai the the whole online community Uh, or the whole dota community saw that strategy and that like, yeah that's a very effective strategy and so now the whole world uses the same strategy that was developed by the ai to to win games um and so here's a, an example of where uh, an ai has come up with a, a piece of knowledge where humans have not discovered before and so that is very exciting this is applied to games but if you can imagine if this method was applied to let's say trying to find out um how to solve our covid situation uh, like try to find uh, a better vaccine for example um which is actually much more complicated than a game <laughs> uh but the possibility is there okay, and that is the application uh, an example application of uh, reinforcement learning All right so those are the three supervised learning unsupervised learning and reinforcement Okay. Uh well, I have a bunch more examples over here, but I think I'll end it already because I've been talking for like one and a half hours really. Um I'll end it over here. Um I have a lot of other resources in case you guys want to go ahead. Um Okay. Oh, I forgot to turn back on my me okay um so to move on ahead you can try to if you want to learn in uh, in this field um try to look up 
Andrew Ng uh, from Stanford University. He uh, has quite a lot of freely available resources online if you want to um, go and dive deep into uh, the, um, the theory behind AI. Uh, if you want to just implement them, uh, my recommendation would be to pick up Python as a programming language. Um, it's not taught in universities typically, uh, but that being said, it's not that difficult to pick up if you've already learned C programming, um, which I think is taught in quite a lot of schools, even in high school. Um, uh, there's a library called OpenCV, um, which is now a public library. And this was just released uh, a few days ago. So this is very, very new. Uh, modelplace.ai, which, which is developed by OpenCV. Okay, so um, in, at this site, you can freely download, uh, well, there, there are models that are freely available and you can download them for free. Uh, if you have developed your own models, you can sell it here. Um, and you can deploy in, in different devices. Uh, you can even test it out first on this website. If you want to know how well it works, uh, you can just throw your picture uh, or video uh, to this website and then it will give you an example of uh, whether it works or not. And you can see a bunch of videos over here that, of what it does. Um, you can try to look up uh, TensorFlow. There's a lot of resources uh, on how to uh, start, it, start it off, uh, but you do need Python as a knowledge to proceed if you want to go that far. Uh, same with uh, OpenVINO by Intel uh, and, or PyTorch by Facebook. Okay, uh, that would be my recommendation if you want to go forward uh, in this area. Or you can join my class. Uh, I teach a final year subject called uh, Artificial Intelligence. All right? Um, questions? I'm done. Okay, all right. Thank you to our speaker for giving such as an amazing talk. Before we end this workshop, I would like to open an Q&A session. If there are any questions, please click the raise hand button and we will call your name. Or you may type your question inside the chat box. Is there any question? Hmm. So if there are no question, then in the count of five, if there are no question, then we may end our session. I have more other question. I want to ask Dr. Uh, Zafi. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Zafi, um, can you hear me? Uh? I can. Okay. I just wonder um, how long, I mean, I'm so interested in your uh, dugong, <laughs> so cute. <laughs> okay, that's a ro the robot. So question. how okay. long? How long do do, you, do they take to actually make the whole thing, like the process of it? How long does it take to get that done? Okay. Uh, how long? Uh? I don't think we took that that long. Maybe three three months. Maybe we we actually had a a collaborator to make the the shell uh, of the dugong. Uh. Um, but the the work of the robot itself, the movement, that's all us. Um, See, so it's the program, la, the inside is all yours. And then the, the shell is like you design the whole thing and then you get someone else to, to like kind of put them together and then you program them, is it? No, um, the, the, our collaborator only made the shell on the outside because that's fiberglass. Uh, ah. We don't have any facility inside Uniten to uh, make our own fiberglass mold oh. nor get the fiberglass material. So the external... Sorry. I see, I see. So you guys put them together. La. You just like ask uh, for... Just the shell. Uh, so what we had to do first, we, we had to create the, the inside. We had to create the skeleton. We ah. had to... We, the, that part had to come first. I so see. This, mov this movement 
of yep. it moving up and down and, and then rotating it can turn. That was huh. done first before it got into the water. Uh, okay. So all the all the waterproofing that all had to be done first, and that was all us. Uh, that's my team over here. Oh my God, I look so young over there. Dr. Carol, um, that as well. Ah, oh, you know Dr. Carol? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fellow, summer, summer last time. Ah, uh, Azli uh, also there. Yeah, Azli, you can see how young he was. So oh this my was a long goodness, time you guys ago. are so young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This oh. was a long time ago. Oh, um, I see. So the, the shell still exists. Uh, it's, it's at our lab in Kamaru, uh, but it's no longer moving lah because we it never had a, a reason to move anymore. So it just went into disrepair. That's all. Uh, but the shell is still there, which means that if anyone wants to pick it up to make it function again, it's very possible lah. I see. Wow, this is, I, I like it. I'm like, I'm like, wow, that is so special. <laughs> Yeah, and mm, it could have gone pretty far, but we ran out of funding. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It seems like there's someone asking question. Yeah. Back to you, uh, Elvin. Oh, how right. to join Kamaro? Oh, sorry. No, I'm just reading the question straight away over here. So. Um, That's all good. That's uh, all good. You can surely do that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll I'll explain it a little bit. We have we have two uh, entities actually. We have uh, the the mobile robotics club, and, and then we have Kamaro, which is different. So students join, join the mobile ro robotics club. Uh, once you graduate, uh, who enters uh, Kamaro is actually any uh, master's or PhD students. Lah. Yeah. Uh, emotional intelligence. Okay, so uh, Mr. Eugene is asking. Uh, thank you, Nabil, for your question. Um, um, so for uh, Eugene, uh, Eugene is asking if AI is able to develop emotional intelligence. Um, so I, I'm gonna I'm going to try and define it first, and if I'm wrong, you you correct me, uh, Eugene. Um, so I'm guessing emotional intelligence is uh, you're you're wondering whether uh, a machine can have feelings. You also correct me if I'm wrong there. So um, if, if that's the case, um, I would probably say it will only know uh, the emotion of, of whatever you teach it. Okay. Um, so let, let's... Uh, um, there we go. So uh, there's already uh, models to detect emotion. So let's say if, if you want to find out whether somebody is looking happy or sad. So we already have models that can do that. So given any video uh, it, as an input. Wow, we're looking at Game of Thrones. There's going to be a lot of sad. Um, there we go. Uh, I'll just have this running. Smaller, so less bandwidth. Um, let's see whether, right. Mm, it's not very clear over here, but that says happy over there. Uh, this guy's uh, emotion is probably horny. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, so we have a skill on there happy, neutral, sad. Yeah, you can see down there sad, uh, neutral. Okay. Um, so if, if you're asking whether it can detect, it can already whether it want whether a machine wants to emote okay whether you want the machine to have emotion uh, again it's whatever we want the uh, reaction to be so if you have a neural network to uh, an AI, AI line in general an AI the input would be um, what is what is um, what is the action being done to the machine, okay, let's say you're slapping in the machine, and then the output, what do you want it to be? Do you want it to be happy being slapped? Can lah. Or you want it to be sad or to be angry? Um, so in the form of the first um, uh, machine learning method that we were talking about just now, if you already classify slap, and then output will be angry. Okay, so then if you teach it to be like that, then that's the emotion, but it's a, an emotion that you teach. Does that answer the question, Eugene? Uh, if not, you can just ask again. 
Um, Mr. Abdul Kayum has a question. His hand is raised. Uh, you can unmute yourself and I guess ask a question. Is that is that okay? Yeah. Alright, hi, Dr. Zafri. My name is Abdul Kayum. Hi, Kayum. Uh, so what I want to ask is, uh, previously I did some, uh, I guess you could say some work with Kamaru, uh, where mm. it's basically what I was doing is the supervised learning. Mm. Uh, so there was this one project where I had to um, help the system to classify some tomatoes. Yeah. Okay. So basically, uh, what I want to ask is, uh, when there, okay, I, I take this tomato as an example. In the pictures, there were uh, there were a bunch of tomatoes in the, let's say, in the farm, on the trees and such. So uh, what you can imagine is there's there are some tomatoes that are very clear and big at the front. Right. And then some tomatoes that are small and kind of blurry at the back. Right. And so the... Uh, I don't know what to call, uh, let's say, I as the supervisor, let's say, I, I don't know what the correct term is, but the one who helped the system to classify the tomato, yep. it, is, it is very hard for me to pinpoint the exact location of the tomato. And so that is, uh, you can, I guess you can say, as some gap in the supervised learning. So is there any way to close the gap and improve the supervised learning to make the system better i guess correct right okay i hope i understand okay um i'm trying to open a couple of slides here to see whether i can okay uh All right, okay, I will share my experience here. Um, so I had uh, a work with uh, Mardi in Serdang, it's nearby Uni 10. Uh, Cik Kayung, uh, who do you work with in Kamaro for this? Uh, I don't quite remember, but I think it was Arfan or Nadia, I think. Right, yeah, okay, yeah, because I assigned them to, to do that. Yep, okay. I don't know, how did you get involved? Oh, is it, well, I'm not sure. Were you one of the data annotators? Uh, yep, I annotate the tomatoes. Right, okay. Uh, then I'll explain what, a little bit on the work that you actually did. Um, okay. Uh, I, I think you, you'll like this because uh, we show where, where your hard work ended up. Um, so the objective of the work with uh, Mardi was that they had a, a, a sort of like a robotic gantry on their tomato, indoor tomato farm. Uh, and they wanted to uh, check, uh, they wanted to count uh, the number of tomato fruits and they also wanted to check the maturity level of the fruit, whether it's ripe enough or not to be picked up. Okay, so we had to do uh, a few things. We had to first detect and localize uh, uh, lo detection. La. We had to find out where is the uh, image of the tomato and then also find out its maturity level. Okay. Okay. Um, so to do that, we need to... Yeah, so that's what we're doing. Like. We have to detect where, where is the tomato, plant in, uh, tomato fruit inside the image and then next to classify its maturity level. Um, and the approach, as you can see on the right hand side here, is to build a data set. That means to collect as many pictures as we can of tomato fruits, tomato plants. Uh, and Kayum, what you did was to annotate the data, to, to draw the bounding box, um, to, as the expert, lah, to say that this is the fruit. Uh, and then we pass this data through uh, a network, okay, an AI network, uh, and this particular one is called Retina Net. Um, and then we do some further steps to optimize it to 
put it inside a, a device at the site. Um, and so the data collection step was to literally scrape through the internet um, or go through YouTube videos and we and, and that's the amount of data that we have. Um, and then, uh, and this is probably the software that you used, I guess, uh, to annotate. Annotate means to label. Lah. Okay, so to label where is the tomato in this picture. So the red tomatoes, green tomatoes, they are all tomatoes. So we have to um, classify all of them. This is manually. This is human. This, this, the human is doing this, this part. Because this is what's given to the machine to learn. So this is the father or the mother um, teaching the uh, grouping together the data first before giving it to the child to learn. Uh, okay, some information about the uh, data set. Uh, and I think the your question is somewhere around here. Lah. How how do you improve the accuracy of this detection? I think that's what you're asking. Um, a couple of things. First of all, the data set needs to be uh, big enough. Um, so usually, the like it, if we're looking at tomatoes, we actually need around like 1,500 to like 3,000 images of tomatoes for an AI to work well. But you'll learn this if you are really going deep into it. Lah. The, basically, the general rule is the more variety of pictures that you have, the better the system is able to generalize. So I was like, uh, if you're teaching uh, a system how to uh, learn what is a cat, but you only give it pictures of white cats, and then suddenly you give it a picture of a black cat, it doesn't know because you haven't taught it that there are also black cats. It's sort of like uh, you teach a system to learn a, a horse, and then suddenly you show it a zebra. It will say that that's not a horse. I don't know what that is, for example. Um, after which we went on to uh, the next step, after we know where the tomato is, we have a classifier to um, classify the maturity level. Uh, and yeah, somebody was saying something. Camilla, you wanted to say something? No. All right. Okay. Um, and so what we did was uh, well, we did a couple of methods, lah. This is a. Uh, we did an image processing approach and then we did an AI approach, which I don't think I have the AI information here. Uh, but let me tell you a secret. We used the teachable machine to, the same teachable machine that I showed you in the website just now. We literally passed the, the data over here to the teachable machine to classify the numbers one to six to tell it the maturity level. Um, yeah, uh, so Kayum, did that sort of answer your question? Better data set, uh, okay. better training uh, tuning parameters. That, that one I didn't really talk about because it's a bit technical. But essentially, if you work with AI, there are some tuning numbers that you can do to make the system learn better. So these two things are the usual things that we need to do. Better data set, and it's usually the data set. Lah. We need better data set, and then uh, tuning parameters. Kayum, okay? Yeah, I guess that answers the questions. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right, thank you. And thank you so much for helping us out there. All right, so Dr. There's a last question from the chat box I see from Eugene also. Uh, Eugene say, it, uh, AI can entirely develop emotions on its own through repetitive learning, such as the Dota example, is it? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Do you want, like, uh, uh, maybe an example emotion is uh, being frustrated? Is it like if, if you're playing Dota, if you if you lose the game and then you want the, the computer to have an emotion, ah, I lost. Uh, and, sir, and then, sir. Yeah, Eugene. Eugene, yeah, Eugene. Yeah, I see. Uh, yeah. Um, actually, uh, this is just like a question to understand better the Sorry. advancements of AI. Um, I think it's a bit clearer. Uh, do you know the game Horizon Zero Dawn? No, I know Valorant. Uh, all right. So technically, I'll just simplify it. Uh, in the game itself, there's an AI uh, which specifies uh, um, more on self-learning and self-thinking. So like it's a technically oh, okay. it's, uh, it's okay, an AI that yeah, it's a technically an AI that uh, 
teaches itself different things and uh, I was always just curious whether it's possible to implement a program that teaches itself uh, in the real world. So uh, I just want to understand that a bit clearer. Thank you. Yeah. Does that, uh, yeah. do you understand or is that a bit confusing? Yeah. Uh, to your question, whether a system can teach itself um, in the real world, yes, because you saw my examples just now. Um, so it can probably, um, sorry, I, I think I didn't quite explain um, in, the, in the Dota example that I gave. There's actually a score that the, that the system is trying to move towards. In the, in the Atari game, it is the is the score lah. It's like how many points can you get? So that that was every cycle is training itself. It's trying to get a higher score. In Dota, there are many different performance performance matrices. It could be what well, ultimately is winning the game lah. But how do you win the game? It's is it by uh, wiping out all the other players or is it consuming as much resources as possible? So what is the the uh, target? Uh, value that it's uh, trying to uh, to maximize. Uh, so in a game situation, there's always something a system should, when you play a game, any game whatsoever, there's a target for you to win. Um, and when a, an AI system learns to play the game, it's doing the same thing. It's trying to win the game. Uh, in the case of uh, Horizon Hero Dawn, I don't know what kind of a game it is. Is it like an open world, just, just move around? So I don't know whether that, there has to be a target lah, uh, for a system to uh, learn towards, a target for it to go towards. I see, sir. Thank you very much. I understand now. Ah. Thanks for the question, Eugene. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you, Doctor. I hope it answers your question. So after attending this workshop, I hope all of you can learn something and give benefits to you in the future.